everyone. Josh Foreman here. In case you forgot who I am or what this channel it is, or why you're looking at your phone or computer. Just doing a few little touch-ups on this guy until I get more people on the stream. Final, final touch-ups. JD, hello, Mordecai, you get extra points for being here uh, 20 minutes early. Uh, the cake, how is it? It's a lie. I succumbed to temptation to have cake yesterday, but today I overcame the temptation of cookies. So I'm pretty proud of myself right now. Why is 20 minutes early slightly on time for you? Are you usually half an hour early? Is that one? Nasir, hello, Linda, hello. Lord, you're early for everything, are you? It's probably better than being late for everything. I guess depending on the culture and the uh, context. get finished getting dust in all the in all the right places this is where dust would naturally build up as this hand goes traversing across the land so I got a bunch on the bottom of his uh, his basket here and when I put it on the stump it didn't didn't really make sense that there wouldn't be dust that has billowed up onto the stump. Which means I have to um, kind of cover up some of the shiny ooze on the inside, but that's okay. Dottie, hello. Mord says, I tend to joke I will be tapping my foot for the Grim Reaper, rolling eyes and demanding to know why he's late. I can see that happening in a uh, Terry Pratchett book. I see here, Josh, are you setting the comment on slow flow? Because when I write something, it takes 20 seconds to show up. Uh, Mord says most likely the stream is on a delay. Yeah, so the options that I have for the stream are like super fast response, but that lowers the image quality. And I figure for a stream that's about doing art, it's more important that you see the art very clearly than that your comments pop up instantly. Alright. What, 
we got going on tonight? Oh, back to uh, back to the old Heather bust, which is um, yet again I had to rip the mouth out, make it super terrifying. So I had here's the uh, here's the thing. I had made these teeth on a previous live, live, not live scream, although it may have caused some people to scream, but a live stream. And this is a half size bust, therefore the teeth should be half size. I think these ended up more like three quarter size and I just didn't think about it hard enough before I put it in, sculpted the lips around it. I could not figure out why I could not get the smile right. And, uh, yeah, after a while I finally figured it out. Oh, the teeth are too big. So, went back and made these that I think are closer to half size. So, here we go. Lips again. JD said, I did not even know this stream started until now. I had to refresh to start the video from the waiting screen. That's not cool. Here, thanks. I, I also think the hand looks dope. Dozer 88. Hello, hello. Glad I'm catching you live stream. Hand looks great. And Nasir is WTF. Yep, yep. I keep, I keep making the sculpture WTF. So. One thing I'm trying to do also, since I'm going to be painting this, um, I wanted to have the same color clay, like inner mouth colored clay for the gums and for the inside of the mouth and then coming out onto the lips. It's kind of, it's a little bit of an engineering um, challenge, but uh, I'm going to try to do it. trying to figure out where the teeth actually have to go without having the actual skull in there. Not great. I think what I need to do is make sure that I've got, um, I've got some play in there. I'm not going to really cement in or, or put in any details until I'm absolutely certain that these teeth are in the right place. Uh, I wonder if you guys had to do that, had to refresh because I, I don't usually um, schedule the live stream, like put an actual time on it, and I did that this time. Um, and so maybe, maybe that makes it dumb. I don't know. Damon. No, um, no bots have uh, come yet, but I imagine they'll be here soon enough. <sighs> so the top of the teeth, where do those appear? But the top of the gums. Uh, or the top, the top of the tooth hits the bottom of the lip pretty perfectly. You do not see gums when Heather smiles, which is great for landmarks. Okay, so if you go from the bottom of the nose, this is about the most flat on image I have. Um, kind of do this thing where I go from the bottom of the nose to the bottom of the top lip, and then I can. Whoop. 
Three force perspective. Pull my finger back. Like get it in the right spot. Let's see if I can get this for the camera. Get the same effect for the camera. So, so picture here. Okay. The portion there. And then as long as the picture and the sculpture are the same size, I'll have the proportions right as well. But due to lens distortion, both from the original photo and from this camera, uh, it's not going to be very precise. So as usual, I'm going to be kind of just futzing with it. I figure since I'm going to be doing a lot of futzing, why not? Um, why not talk about stuff like uh, Star Wars? I got my cool uh, Finn slash Poe Dameron jacket, huh? Pretty cool. Bet you guys wish you had that. I think I got it on Think Geek. Nasir, your teacher looks like this when she laughs, like like this. Oh my god, that's pretty terrifying. You might want to check to uh, see if your teacher is actually a, a living entity or not. I'm gonna start using some of the softer clay to build up the foundation for the teeth. I, uh, I conditioned and rolled out a bunch of clay recently, so I've got some more malleable stuff. Uh, Nasir, sorry, this is a spoilerific episode. I have to talk about Star Wars. I have to. I'm sorry, I gave it a week. So, if you don't want spoilers, uh, I guess your only option is to watch this on repeat after after the movie. I apologize. I knew this would happen to some people. But I figured most people who were like really excited about it have seen it by now. And uh, those who haven't are probably like not super concerned with Star Wars in general. But then I know there is that third category of people who are excited, but just, you know, they've got lives and schedules and financial reasons why they can't have seen it. And for that, I truly am sorry. The reason that I really want to talk about it is because it has to do... It gave me a lot of thoughts both about um, what the movie itself was saying, like a lot of the themes in the movie, well, some of the themes in the movie really resonated with me, uh, but also I think what's happening with the Star Wars universe, you know, movies and all that kind of stuff, um, is very informative to what I'm trying to do with my, uh, world building as I'm trying to build an IP and a brand that, you know, someday I hope it's as big as Star Wars. And so I want to be really cognizant of the good things that they're doing with the brand and the bad things that they're doing with the brand so that I can learn from those things. I mean, the biggest lesson and one of what I think is going to be the biggest innovation of my particular IP is that uh, had test 24 7 and you'll leave. I'm sorry Nasir but be sure to check uh, come back on Saturday where we'll be talking about Tales from Telefar. Um, mythological. You know, George Lucas was doing the Hero of a Thousand Faces and it was a very s small contained story and all of the elements were created to fit that one story. And so 
as a result, the as the universe expanded through popular demand, it kept losing the mythological underpinnings. They kept having to explain more things. Logistics had to be figured out. Um, and because these particular characters were in that story, the, the story became about that family, that those characters, but mostly the Skywalker family. And that's intrinsically limiting. So I'm trying to sidestep both those things. I'm trying to make sure that as the stories in my world roll out, they are not dependent on um, one particular story. I want to make sure that it, we're di diverse from the beginning. And I'm also, rather than being mythological in tone, I'm being uh, Sciency in tone. I'm being scientifically plausible so that from the beginning we don't have to we don't have to change things radically because some off you know some author or game maker whatever who's making something uh, in my world I'm just gonna call it my world you know Tales from Telefar. They have some, you know, radically different vision or something. It's not going to work that way. Damon says, I think all the forced humor at the beginning was terrible. What they did with Finn was a waste of time and meant nothing. Snoke was a letdown. But I liked the focus that things are not black and white and war profiteering. Yeah, so there were... There were definitely a lot of structural problems uh, with the film. Um, I would never defend it as a wonderful, you know, like a, a technically competent movie. But I do think that the themes that it explores more than make up for it. But that is specifically because as a you know, a per you know, my my proclivities as someone who enjoys movies are that I derive most of my pleasure from the themes that a film explores more than the characters or the plot, which is what allows me to like a lot of Shyamalan movies that a lot of people hate, which I will totally admit have a lot of technical and structural problems. Damon says, you're all about story. Yeah, I think probably most people are more story and and character driven, or that that's what that's what they want to be really solid in a film. I think those things are absolutely important, and therefore a film is weaker if they don't if they don't get those right. And I don't think that this movie did get those right. But since I'm so appreciative of theme um, I'm willing to overlook a lot of that stuff more than most people yeah when it comes to the, the story of the movie it definitely feels like um, I can't remember the name of the director slash writer Brian? Brian Johnson? something like that I feel like he was happy to sacrifice um, a lot of stuff to get his point across. I think he was doing his best to do what I hope they did, which was, you know, the, the Force Awakens, they had to establish that they weren't going to be the prequels again, right? They had to convince the world that they know what made the original trilogy awesome and they know what makes the prequels bad and which meant they had to evoke the original trilogy and they you know, maybe they overdid it but, <laughs> but it's better that they overdid that reassurance than underdoing it and then my hope was they would take that trust that they built 
and and then go explore different themes and ideas and get a little more brave. Um, which a lot of people are saying that this movie is so different in so many ways than the others, but man, it sure did have a lot of callbacks to The Empire Strikes Back. A lot, a lot, a lot of callbacks. But the, the things that it did subvert the, uh, the expectations of what a Star Wars movie should be doing and having, um, that it subverted, I think, were subverted in really interesting and surprising ways. I guess surprising ways, which to me makes them interesting. And to other people, they find it upsetting, I think, because they had a very very specific idea of, of um, what Star Wars is supposed to be and what it can't be. Damon says, I would almost prefer that Finn not been in the movie at all, would have brought the runtime down to manageable levels and not had this weird B-plot. And the guy's name is Ryan Johnson. Thank you. Um, but it was almost the opposite of J.J.'s Force Awakens. It was like the opposite of a re-read and subverted every expectation. I would not say it was an opposite of a retread. It had all those echoes of the student going to the master, the master being reluctant to teach the student, the student being, you know, disagreeing fundamentally with the teacher. Um, and then it does stuff different after that. But, you know, the student goes down into a dark cavern and confronts their, themselves. Um, and just over and over again, there were there were a lot of scenes that evoked Empire Strikes, Strikes Back. But I, I think I think the reason that it was evoking those things was to set up expectations that then made the subversion of those expectations shocking and surprising. Uh, as for that B-plot, yeah, I don't know about cutting it all together, I think, I think it was important for the themes of the film to be embodied in action, and one of the themes of the film that are stated explicitly is, I think Yoda is the one who said it, was that failure is the teacher, that is how you learn. Damon says, yeah, that cavern scene could have been cut all together. It made no sense. Tony says, just showed up and haven't seen it yet. Did I miss the spoiler warning? Yeah, look at the title. <laughs> I put the word spoiler gigantic in the title of the video. Let me, let me double check and make sure it's actually in there. Just, just to make sure I'm seeing the same thing you're, you're seeing, does the title say Life Smile Sculpting Demo Heather Bus and Last Jedi Spoiler Talk? Because now I'm worried that things weren't set up right since people had to refresh and click and weird stuff like that. Alright Tony, yeah, so, sorry to drive you away, um, but yeah, watch this after you've watched the movie. Yeah, I, I am not a fan of people who uh, spoil spoil things for others without warning. That's that's an awful thing to do. But I think. I think the impossible situation that the showrunners for Star Wars are in is that you have competing impulses, and I know all about this from working in video games. You have a portion of fans that are going to slam you if you stick too close to what's been done before, and you have a portion of fans who are going to slam you if you 
depart too much from what they think, you know, why they were attracted to the franchise in the first place. So no matter what, you're going to be making some portion of people upset. And uh, so when I when I think of my own IP that I'm creating, I think it's really important to establish early on that there's not one set of characters or one set of themes that Talifar is about. So that I don't create that expectation from the beginning that a Tales from Talifar book or movie or game or whatever needs to be, you know, needs to have, you know, sword fights or wizard battles or, you know, um, boat chase, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, there should always be fun, new, surprising, interesting themes and characters in my in my world you shouldn't be coming to it because you're expecting a story about space wizards with laser swords and a black and white good and evil battle I'm trying to think of another IP that has done that if you guys can think of one let me know like what's a new IP that's that's been created it doesn't even need to be new I mean any IP a series of books or films or games where you feel like they could do almost anything in the next installment and it wouldn't be like letting down half the fans for being too similar to something that came before it and the other half of fans for being not different enough. Angelic, hello! David says he did go really hard on failure because it was like one failure after another. Yeah, I think that's I think that's what he was counting on to make this dark. It was subverting everything you thought you knew about the Force and it was showing these characters going through the try-fail cycle, but um, it's just the, the failure part in this movie and presumably <laughs> what that leaves for JJ to pick up, you know, the hook for JJ to hook into is how they've learned from all the mistakes that were made and uh, and apply that in creative character building successful ways. David says, I think people getting angry over this is just silly, but I'm not one of the diehard fans. I definitely like this one way better than The Force Awakens. Space Wizards are what created the fandom though. JJ was just pitching the plot for episode 9, so who knows, this, this last week. Yeah, I don't... I don't know how they could not have had, like, a through line for the whole trilogy kind of established from the beginning. I don't know how you take a, bill, you know, $4 billion franchise and not plan it out like that. It, this movie makes it seem like that wasn't a thing. Like this, uh, this Brian Johnson guy was just given, was told by Disney, hey, make an awesome middle film. He was like, all right, I'm just going to write it by myself and do whatever. And they're like, all right, cool. But that's not how things work, but especially at a corporation like Disney. It says written and directed by Ryan Johnson. I'm like, okay, technically, I, I guess he could have written most of those words, but as far as like having everything vetted, there has to be more going on than just them just giving it to auteurs and saying, all right, just do your thing with, with our franchise. Damon says, me either. I was really surprised to find it out and then read about Ryan saying in an interview that he could do whatever he wanted. Well, before all this, Colin Trevorrow had it all laid out and they hated it. Hmm. Hmm. I, 
Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just very skeptical of what, like, the all the behind the scenes, all the interviews, all of that stuff is, is very tightly controlled. The impressions that we get are, you know what I mean, like, there's, there's micro level stuff like the expressions on actors' faces. You know, or body language when the director's talking about stuff that Disney can't control. But as far as, like, the general uh, message that's being sent, Disney has to approve all of that before it goes out. I c it would be very hard for me to be convinced otherwise. But the one thing I really loved the most about the movie was what a lot of people hated, which was the subversion of what we've always been told about the Force. Because, I mean, since watching the movies as a kid, like, okay, I saw Empire Strikes Out, Strikes Back, when I was little. So that was 1980. I was five years old when it came out. And I remember it pretty well. And I remember being very confused when Yoda explained that size matters not. Because the logical question you would ask is, okay, if Yoda is, on, is against the Empire, and if size matters not, why doesn't he just hurl the entire Empire fleet into a sun and be done with it? And at that point, I guess I guess the fact that that didn't happen um, was that was like a clear signal to me that either the the force, isn't what the Jedi's think it is, or the Jedi's don't actually care that much about the politics and the, the suffering of innocence and all that kind of stuff. Um, or it's just, you know, a, a gaping plot hole. Um, which, which again, I mean, these stories are mythological and they're not, you know, the more you try to, to scientificize them, that's a great word, scientific size. Say that five times fast. Uh, the more they're just gonna slip through your fingers, you know. The harder you squeeze, the more they slip through your fingers, much like the Rebel Alliance. And so, and so the fact that Yoda comes around in this movie I'm just going to say spoilers for anyone who just joined me and didn't read in the title of their spoilers. So when Yoda shows up and is like, yeah, F all this Jedi BS, who cares about it anyway? Uh, to me, that was like actually super thematically appropriate because St Star Wars came from a dude who came of age in the 50s and 60s and was a you know, in college in the 60s when it was all about hippies and Eastern, you know, the, the uh, Eastern religious and philosophical influences were really starting to take hold um, in, you know, campus life and intelligentsia. And that was reflected by Lucas with, with the Force and with Yoda uh, he's very much a Buddhist kind of archetype of the of the um, surprising, subverting spiritual guru, who's like his, his students come to him and say, "Okay, you said this, so I figured out the rules. This is how the system works, right?" And then there'll be a surprising. Uh, you know, subversion of whatever rules they came up with. The teacher will say, nope, it's the opposite. Or, you know, it, like, 
Eastern religion is filled with those kind of aphorisms that are like, you think this because of that, but it turns out, no, something completely different. And then if you try to make a rule out of that, then that will be subverted. So it's like the whole point of a lot of Eastern religion, at least as it's interpreted by the West and as I've imbibed it, I'm not going to pretend to talk about it with any amount of authority. Um, but the, the way the West has interpreted Eastern religion is that it's all about staying out of a box of orthodoxy. And all the Jedi Order stuff that came about, especially in the, uh, in the prequels, where they've got a whole, like, it's practically a political slash religious, you know, hegemony. Hegemony? Hegemony? Hegemony. Um, where they're like, you know, the masters of the universe, and then they have all these, like, weird ascetic uh, rules and stuff about, you know, you can't love, you can't, you know, it's, it's just a mishmash of nonsense. You know, only a Sith deals in absolutes, you know, self-defeating sort of garbage like that. It just... It makes perfect sense to me that Yoda would transcend that at some point. Would realize, you know what, it turns out all this... All these man-made structures and dogmas and stuff that we've built around our understanding of the Force... Um, it was just vanity. It was mistaken. And so... And I guess because I kind of have been on a, on a similar-ish spiritual journey where I came from a very fundamentalist um, literalist interpretation of Christianity and moved to a different place since then that and not a place where I'm contrary to it right I didn't I didn't say oh I've grown out of that I'm just I'm more whatever now like I have these different ideas that are better no it's just more like oh you know what I'm not I'm just not smart enough or gifted enough or whatever enough to to trust that what I think is absolute truth so I'm not going to pretend that I do know absolute truth um and so I guess I went through a process like that so Yoda burning the the Jedi text resonated with me Damon says, no doubt it is all approved. Speaking of the PR stuff, I just don't think that everything has been all storyboarded out before the trilogy started. And size matters not uh, to a point. <laughs> yeah, so, so why? Why is there a point? Why is there a limitation? Yeah, so people people trying to systematize, come up with rules, creating orthodoxy, creating canon about what is and is not possible with the Force. This movie was all about saying, no, that, that's all garbage, just throw it away. You, you don't know. What makes you think you know? Um, and I thought that was delightful because that's the conclusion I came to with, with um, religion and spirituality in general. I was just like, wait, I don't know. I'm going to stop pretending that I know. Okay, I'm going to put some gum color in here now. Damon says, it's more throwing the prequels away. That sought to measure and define a lot. Yeah. Definitely, definitely a big part was that. There's, there's so many ironies in what Lucas did with the sequels. Just the absolute, um, is it deafness? Is it revert, like, 
George Lucas was so explicit about how technology can kill the spirit of a thing. You know, the Ewoks were the embodiment of the of the natural soul uh, destroying the soulless, technologically superior empire. And, um, and then the way he goes about making the prequels is just the technology absolutely overran everything. The way they were created destroyed any semblance of, of spirit or soul that those movies could have had. I mean, along with his truly horrific writing and apparently direction. I don't know how else you get such wooden performances out of such great actors. Dumb. Dumb is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, thank you, Dean. <laughs> I mean, I don't like to crap all over people's hard work, um, but I think there's just really instructive lessons you can take away from that sort of thing. So yeah, I've been reading a lot of a lot of reviews, a lot of pontificating, a lot of both negative and positive stuff about it, and I think I've agreed with almost everything I've read. Like all the negative stuff is, yep, I can't argue with it. Like there's a lot of cheesy, stupid, uh, poorly done things in the movie for sure. But but to me, the the themes that resonated with me so deeply and the subversion of expectations was such a, a breath of fresh air um, that I, I can't I can't not like it can't even So in theory, if you see through the lips, way back into the little pockets of the mouth between between the teeth and the and the inside of the cheek, you'll be seeing this colored material. But it's going to be so dark in there, you you know, you won't be able to tell. However, if there is a light shined on it somehow or if the smile gets a little wider than I plan or whatever uh, this is there it's there as a as a backup um, and I won't ever feel compelled to try to stick a paintbrush between you know the corner the corner of the smile and the teeth because that is terrifying put a, a paintbrush in that you know that's like You'd have to be able to shoot a womp rat at 60 meters or whatever to uh, be able to pull that off. One thing I am curious about is a lot of a lot of the negative reaction. I don't, I don't know if anyone said the word specifically, but the, the feeling I get is that they think that Ryan Johnson is actually being disrespectful to the Star Wars franchise. Is like, like trolling <laughs> uh, people who love Star Wars. Like he took this, this gig just so he could make fun of, of Star Wars fanboys or something. Um, I, it's possible, but I feel like that's pretty unlikely. I guess I'd have to watch some actual interviews with him to know. I, I, that's something I haven't done, is actually looked at all the Disney PR that they've put out for it. Aletha, hello! Have you seen Star Wars yet? 
Um, if not, this is going to be spoilerish. I know you were contemplating it. Did you actually uh, brave the mall and go and see it? Oh good, you saw it. So Damon, what points do you think he was actually trolling? And what do you think the spirit behind that trolling was? You think it was like a, you guys are such idiots, or what a bunch of nerds. Or was it more like, haha, this is funny, just because you expected one thing, but here's another thing. I, I feel like those are two different kind of people that are being descri described. Letha says, the mall was okay before the movie, but I skipped getting mice for the snake on the way up because it got really crowded. That's fair. I think the snake will survive. Not my reference. I'm looking at where the teeth are in relation to the nose. And it looks like it's a little less than halfway. I mean, probably a third of the way from where the nose starts. You go straight down and that's where the front teeth are. So if I look at a profile here, find a flatter thing. So here's the back of the nose, it's about a third of the way down the nose, and it looks like the teeth are short of that. So they probably need to come out a touch. Again, depending on a bunch of factors like camera lenses and the actual angle of the head, blah blah blah. But making the best educated guesses I can right now. I should have done that before I started packing all this stuff around it. I think his treatment of humor was disrespectful. He turned General Hux, or whatever his name is, into a caricature. What the Force can do and cannot do is just whatever he wanted. I'm mostly fine with it regardless. I think the dumb humor is what annoyed me the most. Yeah, um... Hmm. I... I enjoyed that first part. I know it felt flat, fell flat for a lot of people. That's kind of that's kind of Poe's thing is trolling bad guys. You know, it, it was established with um, uh, Kylo Ren when he first meets him, where he asks him who talks first. Um, so I didn't feel like that was particularly out of character, out of place, or out of tone. Um, Yeah, the, that's something that I that I read in a review that it definitely is true. It's like there's there's no there's no one scary left in the Empire. They're all buffoons or you know wild cards, um, which I'm guessing means they're going to introduce uh, some big bad general that you know was hadn't been shown yet in the next movie. Because yeah, there's. I don't know how anyone could take Huck seriously. Like, if you imagine Grand Moff Tarkin being trolled like that, it's like, no, that, that really wouldn't work. So, 
uh, damage was done to the credibility of that character as a menacing person. Absolutely. Is that is that trolling the audience? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um. I'm gonna leave the teeth there for now. They're not. This, I don't think this image is. I don't think this image is a perfect enough profile to base it on. Because if the teeth come out any further, they're like coming out past the nasal labial folds, and that's just like that would be ridiculous. So when it comes to humor, obviously humor is one of those tastes that is very subjective. Um, you know, the last movie I saw was the Justice League movie, and absolutely all of those quote-unquote humorous lines fell completely flat to me. Um, and I felt the reason was because tonally it was just a total juxtaposition of what was happening in the film. Uh, and character breaking maybe they established the flash was a goofball so it was okay when he made jokes he was probably the funniest one but the rest of them were just they just felt weird and stilted it felt very much like exactly what it was which was they hired Joss Whedon as a script doctor to come in and give it some life um yeah, it turns out that doesn't work very well when the act, when the overall structure is constructed to just be a series of awesome vignettes of, you know, cool poses and explosions. But. I also feel like, so I explained why I like Yoda's uh, actions and words in the movie. I think what resonated with me about Luke was that um, he clearly went through a phase where he was an evangelist for a Jedi teacher. He, was, he had a school of, of Jedi, right? So like he was on board, he was a zealot, he was an apologist for Jedi religion. And I had a very similar thing where I used to actively evangelize and I was an apologist for um, evangelical Christianity for many years because I thought it was like super important to keep people from going to hell. Well, you know, it's like, and then I went through a personal catastrophe in my life and felt like I came out of that humble. I didn't come out of it with different beliefs. It's like, oh, all of that is BS now. I just came out of it humbled. And I feel like Luke was humbled. He was like, I thought I could do all this stuff, and I thought I would do it right, and as, you know, because I was doing it right, good things would happen, and it turns out, nope, terrible things happen. And so now he's just like, he, he's kind of lost. And that's kind of how I am. Uh, from an epistemological standpoint in my life, but I'm more at peace with it than he. He was clearly brooding and upset about it. I'm, I'm not that way. One thing I posted on Facebook today um, was about Sanderson's laws. He has three general principles about using magic in fiction. And, um, man, if uh, Ryan Johnson would have incorporated those rules into his script, the movie could have been a lot stronger. I mean, in general, if all authors followed those rules, I think they'd be a lot stronger.
Damon says, Yoda's scene was amazing outside the lightning strike. Force ghosts shouldn't be doing things. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, like, why shouldn't force ghosts be doing those things? What principle of the magical system of the force tells you that they can't affect physical matter in the physical world? I have, I've heard many people say, complain about that, and, and I, I mean, I'm legitimately curious. I'm not challenging you and saying, hey, dummy, I'm, I'm curious. Like, what is it about the Force that makes you think it can't be used that way? I thought this, you know, the main, one of the main themes of this movie was the Force that had been secreted away in dogma and religious institution is breaking free of that and it's seeping out into the you know what the bible would call the least of these you know the, the poor uh, enslaved children and such because the old religious institution that used to to house it has you know crumbled away And, you know, the person who used to be the master of that religious institution, Yoda, he's like, totally cool with it. I, I, you know, you get the impression there's some kind of enlightenment that happens after death. Damon says, sure, but you open the can of worms and ask, why don't force ghosts take a more active role then? Why do they just sit by and do nothing while evil reigns? Letha says, because they want the living to build character. Damon says, why don't the force ghosts seek to bring about more balance? Damon says, sure, but then Yoda's action defies that. Yeah, so in the original trilogy, Certainly in Empire, I mean, Yoda's actions in Empire and, and Return of the Jedi, he, he's always been pretty standoffish as far as direct action. I, I think which is, which is what made the prequel so jarring is like he becomes a, a you know, field general or he's like out there marshalling troops and it's just, uh, doesn't make sense. But yeah, I, I, I agree with Aletha's thing it's like they could do all this stuff but I mean once you're dead you probably realize that like life and death is just kind of this abstract concept and it's not actually a catastrophe for a person to die um, and so you probably have a very different uh, uh, approach to uh, what types of goods you can bring to the living because just staying alive it turns out isn't that important but yeah the, the concept of balance in the force was also one of those things that kind of breaks down upon examination like Well, again, especially in the prequels where it's like, okay, so the quote-unquote good Jedi pretty much rule the galaxy. They have complete control over the political, economic, and spiritual landscape. And they're looking for the chosen one who's going to bring balance to the Force. It's like, uh, doesn't that imply that it's going to be a negative for everyone around? Yeah, so I, I don't know. Ozzel, hello! We're talking spoilers for Star Wars, so tune out if that will hurt your enjoyment of Star Wars if you haven't seen it. Damon says, if Yoda's the teacher, the lightning strike felt more like him writing the answer down instead of letting the student, Luke in this instant, figure it out himself. 
Um, I mean, maybe they're not in a teacher-student relationship anymore. Maybe the significance of the guy who used to run all the Jedis being the one to burn the text is more important than one particular dude learning a lesson. You know, maybe the universe just needed to be free of those texts. Man, I'm really coming at this really slow. I'm not sure why. I think I'm a little trepidatious because I've attempted this <laughs> this smile like uh, four times now and failed every time. Damon says, that's the prevalent theory, that Vader was the balance, but the balance in the way the Jedi didn't want. Letha says, I think Luke was being extra dense and needed a smack upside the head in that case, so that's why Yoda did the lightning. Damon says, I suppose, but it could have been very easily been a dramatic pause, then Luke tosses the flare in. Letha says, true that, Damon says, or a couple more lines of dialogue, instance of the lightning set piece, instead of the lightning set piece. I'm kind of worried that these teeth are going to be too low. Well, it's pretty far. <laughs> it looks so derpy right now. Oh my god. Let's give her a little Hitler mustache. That'll fix it. I think, um, getting back to the B plot. That was probably the part I enjoyed the least. It definitely gave me flashbacks to the um, prequels. Like all that CG, um, art deco, you know, spotless interiors with aliens with funny hair and... Yeah, that did not make me happy. That was certainly the most ham-handed part of the movie, I thought, was that whole, like, oh, look at these children who are being whipped, and the animals that are being whipped, and these rich jerks who are selling weapons and gambling. And... Very heavy-handed. That part, it, it, I think what's weird is tonally, it just felt like suddenly they shifted into a bad kids movie when they were on that planet. Everything was over the top silly, it had a bunch of kids in it, it was just so much CG and like wacky alien design as opposed to cool alien design. Like, what I've always loved about the Star Wars universe was the alien design, was how Bizarre, like, Hammerhead is one of my favorite aliens ever. Um, collecting the toys as a kid and stuff, it's just, I've always loved their alien and creature design. And so when they do wacky ones, it's very disappointing to me. Damon says the casino, C casino CG was so bad. Finn being taken in by the wonders didn't make sense either. He knew he was on a severe timetable. Yeah, that, yeah. 
There are a lot of structural problems with that. I think uh, when I when I go back to see it for a second time, that's going to be my bathroom break. <laughs> so they get to the CG planet. BB-8 slot machine. Uh, I really don't like the B plot. Um, I actually like the BB-8 slot machine. I thought that was legitimately funny. Um, I could, I can see how how any normal person would not find that funny. The the little drunk Monopoly alien guy. <laughs> They're just. Uh, yeah, everything about that the design of that planet was just so kids movie. I don't get it. I, I guess it's it's how um, adults felt. People who were adults when Return of the Jedi came out and they you know went to the Ewok tribe, they probably felt the same way. I was like, what? No, Star Wars is just a silly kids movie. All right. Alitha says, I need to get a BB-8 for the cats. I thought the BB-8 slot machine was funny, but that planet, yeah. Kids movie. Wasn't impressed. The Star Wars has all... The, the original trilogy was groundbreaking in that it was a film that was fun enough and imaginative enough to be a draw to kids without being a kids movie. I don't know that movies had ever done that before. I think they were either like, you know, the old Disney movies from the 60s and 70s, they were, they were for kids and very Okay, I need I need to rethink this because I guess films like uh, Mary Poppins, Bed Knobs, and Broomstick those were, if if I understand it correctly, they were critically acclaimed. Like adults and kids appreciated them both. Okay, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I'll still contend that the original trilogy did a great job of not lowering itself to being to having that tone with the exception of the Ewoks which I you know I was still a kid when that came out so I did not feel what adults did at the time um, but I can totally understand how they would Oh, you lost the stream. What? I, hmm. You know, I forgot to tell my son to just not play Rust while I'm streaming. I meant to do that and I forgot. I'm guessing that might be what's going on. Um, last time it was uh, freezing up on my last stream. Uh, I think that was because my wife was uploading a video she she had uh, edited for our church and she was emailing that and it was giant so i think i think it was more that and less the windstorm Rest is a difficult game, lol. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, I don't get it. <laughs> like, I, I guess if you're playing with a bunch of friends and you have 
you've created an explicit goal for yourself, it could be fun, but I've never been in that experience. I just see my son dying over and over and over and over, and I, without, without a very specific goal, it doesn't have to be something the game tells you to do, but without some kind of goal, I don't see the point. Okay, I'll wag my finger at Heather. Well, you know, I'm already making her look incredibly ugly uh, on this live stream, so I'd say that's, that's probably good enough punishment. actually jumped out at me the most in like a take you out of the movie moment uh, was not the dorky alien designs on the casino planet or the uh, totally non-subtle um, messages there it was when I can't remember her name the the new general they introduced uh, the, the woman from Jurassic Park who had purple hair um, She's the last one on the on a ship, and she jumps to light speed through the enemy fleet and like rips ships in half. It was like, that's that's a thing. Like, if that's a thing, then everything about space warfare would be completely different. Hodor, Hodor, maybe maybe your name is Hodor. Whole dough. I think it was whole dough. Damon says. Damon says that scene was amazing. Yeah, visually, that was one of the mo the standout scenes. That and the uh, the team up lightsaber fight. That was probably one of the greatest scenes in Star Wars. The, the that whole throne room scene was. It had tension, like legitimate tension. It had legitimate surprise, it had great action and cinematography, set design, like everything was on point in that scene. I loved it. I'm trying to think of a better Star Wars scene. Maybe, maybe when, um, when Han Solo is being put in Carbonite, that's a pretty fantastic scene. What else is really good? Alright, name your favorite Star Wars scenes. I, I need to think of something that can compete. gonna spread it over the around the whole mouth and then to actually shape the lips I'll just carve away the layer of pink where I where I need it to be gray. <laughs> Alita says my mind promptly went blank. Yep, same here. Yoda and Luke, uh, when Yoda raises the ship out of the out of the swamp, that was pretty iconic and incredible. It's hard for me to say any of the space scenes were, you know, just inc they were certainly incredible and groundbreaking for their time, but. 
I don't know, like, it's... Space battles have never been something that I've found particularly interesting. Darth Vader's fight with Luke Skywalker on the catwalk in Cloud City. Mind blowing. Um, yeah, a lot of those scenes uh, are in Empire. No wonder people tend to call that one the best one. Speeder chase on Endor, yes, also very good. Cloud City the first time. Anything specifically of scenes in the first, like I mean, the showdown between uh, Obi Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader was certainly emotionally charged, but boy, was it hobbled by the by the um, uh, what is, what is it, how people move. What is that called? I mean, clearly neither of them had ever swung swords before <laughs> that's pretty pretty bad for people that are supposed to be masters at this craft they're just kind of randomly flailing at each other clearly trying to hit each other's sticks together as opposed to hit the other person See. Damon says Lucas didn't direct the second one. It's why everyone likes it. Huh. Yeah, that certainly helped it. Uh, Ivan Kirshner is a far better director. Um, he didn't direct the third one either. So. I should go back and watch the original trilogy again. I haven't seen it in probably I don't know. Yeah, I guess I guess I watched it before The Force Awakens came out. So when was that? Two and a half years ago or something. But yeah, I'm having trouble thinking of just like truly awe-inspiring epic scenes like the throne room scene and in Last Jedi. I mean, the, the cantina from the original Star Wars, again, groundbreaking for its time, uh, certainly got my imagination fired up as a kid, but I mean, by today's standards, it's pretty cheesy. Maybe it's not fair to hold it to today's standards. But I mean, I don't think there is a single influence on my creative life bigger than Star Wars. So it's interesting to me that personally, it's it's not hard for me to um, to be distant and analyze these films critically without well, uh, without what I can perceive as a lot of emotional uh, investure in there. I don't. 
I, I don't feel like super disappointed when Star Wars movies come out that I don't like. I, although I think The Phantom Menace probably probably did that to a lot of people. It just seared their conscience, right? It was just like, well, not conscious, but seared their expectations to the point where, wow, anything that's not god awful in the Star Wars universe, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be just fine with. You know, I may not love the movie like Rogue One. Eh, it's fine. I liked it. It had it had more stuff in the Star Wars world, and that's what I want to say. I want to see cool ships and aliens and robots and and funny quips here and there and some laser battles and and I'm good. You know, I don't. I'm not expecting more than that. And a lot of people seem to be expecting more than that. Okay, so I'm looking specifically at the thickness of the top lip because when you smile, it you know flattens your upper lip around your teeth, which is going to thin your lip a little bit. There's still some thickness there. I'm just I'm trying not to overdo it because if you smile and have your lips sticking way out from your teeth. It ends up making you look like you've had that, you know, that plastic surgery where you have like saline pumped into your lips or something. Aletha says, I really liked Rogue One. Damon said Rogue One had too many plot holes. Damon says, these are not the droids you're looking for. Is a great scene from the first. Yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, Moss Eisley in general was amazing. Friesenberger, hello, how's it going? Damon says, camped out for two weeks for episode one. <laughs> I have a lot of great memories of time spent with friends, but man, that movie. Uh, yeah, that was a lot of dissonance for fanboys to process. Uh, that was rough times. I remember the the posters and the you know all the all the stuff that you knew about it leading up to its release seemed to indicate oh my god this is going to be incredible and there was like this period of time for a couple days after it came out where it seemed like almost everyone was like that was amazing and then about a week later, people started to get more sober about it. And you started actually seeing fans uh, expressing disappointment. Um, but yeah, there was, there was a, a lot of carryover from, from the hype that it was actually happening after all these years that took a while to uh, dispel. I don't know, Damon, did you, did you guys feel it instantly? Like, did you actually walk out of the theater saying, ugh, what a stinker? Or was there a, a period where you were like, wow, that, yeah, that was cool, and that other part was cool. Yeah, I remember when that other thing happened, that was cool. That's how me and my friends were processing it, at least. Damon said, it took until an hour after we watched and we're all sitting around talking about it. Oh, okay. Well, that was, that was fast. Faster than me and my friends. Good job. Although, actually... Now that I, that I recall, I did not, so I had tickets to see it opening day. I had my friend who was camped in line to see the first showing of it. And we got there like six hours early to hang out. And we were there so early, we were like, eh, rather than sitting in line, why don't we just go see a movie? So my wife and I uh, went and watched The Matrix because that had came out 
either that same week or the week before. And, um, and we came out, and there was still like an hour before the movie uh, had started, before Star Wars had started. And so we went, my friend was in the theater, so, you know, we went in the theater, and yeah, we had seats, it was just like the seat on the very front right and a seat on the very front left were the two seats left. <laughs> so I was like, I am not experiencing this life-changing movie event in the corner. That is not right. And so we just, we left and um, ended up not seeing it for maybe a month after that. And so I, I think I heard second hand through my friend. I, I watched my friends go through the process that I had not gone through. So I think I went in with much lower expectations when I actually did get to see it. Damon, you have middle center. Congratulations. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, that pod race was pretty cool, wasn't it? Except for that announcer. Oh, God, that announcer. So much. Damon, is that ellipses in, in response to me saying the pod race is cool? I think I mean it was cool just from a um, like a technical and pacing and just strict, strictly the technical aspects of it were pretty cool like all those different environments and the desert they were going through and there was tension and you know it was, it was, the, it was a classic racing scene the bad guy does something bad and cheaty but then the good guy finds a way to come you know it, it was a nice compact uh you know little drama with cool vehicles and awesome sound design and great set design It's <laughs> just the name Annie makes you cringe. Yeah, that was, yeah. Fries, you like them Joker lips, though? Yeah. I'm pretty impressed with them as well. But, uh, more importantly, the teeth seem to be the right size for the scale, I think. But now I'm looking at it and they look too small, which doesn't make sense because... These were the teeth I had before, and they were way too big, and, um, wow, maybe it's not that the teeth were too big, maybe it's that the arc was too wide, and if I, if I could thin this, it would be better. Keep messing with it, just, just cause. Yeah, so the idea is, once I once I have the shape of the lips right, I'm just gonna go in like this and cover up the parts that shouldn't be pink, and I won't have smeared pink all over it. But I'm just trying to get the shape right, and I want the where the where the lips fold under and into the teeth. I don't want to have to paint in there. Damon says the pod race looked cool but made no sense. Um, 
the plot around it didn't make sense. I think internal to it, though, it made sense, if I recall. Like, they established how the devices worked. They established who the bad guy was. Um, they established that, you know, they were looking to see if Anakin had use of the Force. And he demonstrated that with how he won the race. The whole, like, gambling on him winning was just ridiculous and unnecessary, but, you know, it was a contrivance, and Lucas didn't have any better ideas, but that's not a direct part of the race. Oh, the pod race just didn't belong. Yeah, it wasn't really... It, it was clearly contrived, but, you know, it wasn't like the speeder bike chase in Return of the Jedi where it was like, oh, okay, so the troops need to get around on these vehicles and they captured some of them and a chase ensues. Makes sense. This was definitely not that. Yeah, Heather might get her jaw ripped off again. I wouldn't put it past me. Right now it's pretty ginormous anyway. has a really tiny little jaw. Mm -hmm. so this taper really needs to be brought in a bit. Yes, Freisenberger, the face does need to be more slender. But, you know, the really positive thing that came from the prequels was uh, Red Letter Media's Plinket review of them, which is still probably one of my top five favorite things the internet has ever produced. So I can't complain too much. Cave and a haircut. Two bits. Yeah, Red Letter Media is one of the few uh, streams that I watch. Pretty much watch all of their videos. The best of the worst is really great.
I mentioned on their um, Last Jedi review that um, someone had told them that uh, Ryan Johnson, did I get that right this time? Whoever the writer director of The Last Jedi was, uh, was a fan of theirs. And he said he both um, loved and feared them. <laughs> it's pretty funny. I'm sure he. I'm sure he saw their review of it. I don't. I don't know how I would. How I would take that. I mean, I feel like when you're working on a franchise like that, you've got so many different considerations and concerns and stakeholders who are forcing things in different directions. Like, I certainly know a lot of criticism about games that I've worked on are all things that I'm like, yes, I totally agree, and I sure wish we could have fixed that, and everyone on the team really wanted that to not be the, the case, and there was either technological or budgetary or... Um, yeah, that's usually it. Technological and budgetary reasons why we couldn't do a thing, or a thing ended up in a uh, in a way that we don't we don't like. Oh, I spent all that time layering on stuff, and now I'm shaving most of it off. It's it's great use of time. things that stood out to me about The Last Jedi, now that I'm thinking through various things, the, <laughs> the little baby seal penguin uh, creatures that are on Luke's island. Um, Chewbacca is cooking one of them over a fire, but the prop he's holding looks like a rubber chicken, like a car... It was such a cartoon. It was weird. Dottie is asking, how is the sculpture not top-heavy? Do you have the armature screwed into the base? Yeah, it's screwed in here. It is top-heavy, so it's kind of cracking there. Not a big deal. Once I get the hair and stuff over there, it'll be fine. Um, a large part of the head is, you know, a big wad of aluminum foil, so it's not solid clay. understand like on a movie of that scale with that budget how a prop like that slips through or or was art directed to be like that Korgs were an obviously blatant marketing ploy I have mixed feelings about that accusation about many things in general because I know in games that I've worked on and in my own world that I'm developing there's different design spaces that you can work in and it's fun to have like characters that are in that kind of cute silly um design space it's it's like if you're composing a symphony right you want to have 
some some loud notes and some soft notes you want fast you want slow you, you know you want that contrast um, you want you want minor keys and major keys uh, and the same same thing when you're designing creatures for a world you want some terrifying ugly things you want some cute cuddly things just like the real world you know so I mean, I don't doubt that there's executive orders to make sure that there's stuff that will sell well at Christmas. But I, I don't think that those are actually necessary. I don't think that people in the creature shop are like, Oh man, I guess we have to make a cute thing now because corporate made us. You know, I don't think, I don't think it works that way. I think there were plenty of artists who were really excited about making these cute little uh, seal penguin things. Damon says the denizens of the island were enough comic relief on the island without porgs. Yeah, those, those poor guys. That was. That was. Uh, hmm. How did I feel about that? I felt conflicted about those guys because it was like, okay, this is funny that they have to clean up after Ray while she's doing all these exercises. But it also kind of makes her a not good person. Like, she almost kills them. And she's just like, oh, sorry. You know, like, ah, wah, almost killed you. Um, that wasn't, so that wasn't cool. Well, I don't find practical jokes that are that are actually dangerous to be funny at all. And that's kind of working off of that same humor bandwidth there. Because, um, you know, some percentage of dangerous practical jokes actually end up maiming or killing people. It's like, it, that's worth it for you to feel clever? No, that's not worth it. David says they were giant fuzzy gerbil penguins that could fly. Yeah, the fact that they made them fly was really weird. They were clearly more penguin <laughs> than uh, albatross. Uh, a creature artist I really enjoy and have sought advice from um, and taking her creature workshop is uh, Terry Whitlift, and she's done design for lot, lots of movies, uh, lots of Disney stuff. She actually worked on the prequels. Um, you know, you can't blame her for the prequels being bad. She, she made cool creature designs. Um, but she worked on the Star Wars Wildlife book, did all the illustrations and, and most of the writing for it too. And um, the way that you know, she had to try to justify some of these bizarre, nonsensical uh, physical attributes of the creatures in the world. It was, it's pretty hilarious. It's kind of like, you know, when, when uh, people came up with a way to justify the Millennium Falcon making the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs or whatever. You know, where it's like, um, that's a unit of distance, not time. But, uh, you know, leave it to the fanboys and they will super cleverly come up with a reason why you can measure the Kessel Run in, in uh, distance instead of time. And it's, it's a really good explanation too, so. Damon says, at that point they were still building the theory that Ray might join Kylo, so I thought it good s subtle building that she may or may not be a completely good person. Oh, okay, like, yeah, she might legitimately not care if she accidentally kills these little guys. Alita says, I like the crystal foxes, pretty. Yeah, they were pretty. Uh, I was shocked to see a behind the scenes snippet where they actually built those things as pup animatronic puppets. I was like, really? Because. I do not remember seeing any scenes where they looked anything other than completely CG. That's cool.
<sighs> so I'm kind of struggling with where the corners of the mouth end up. You know, I took all these pictures of Heather and, you know, she was obviously just, you know, I asked her to smile and she did a fake smile, which isn't super helpful. But, like, if you look at it at different angles, like here, you can see, here's, here's the middle of the lip, right? And it comes almost down to the corner for that smile. This smile, obviously her head is tilted slightly down, so it looks like it goes up to the corner there. Here it's kind of even, so it's like I, I did not have a lot of good direction for where to actually get that. Because A, I don't have an actual legitimate smile picture of her, and B, I don't have a, like a full 360 rotation of her where I can have consistent landmarks to work off of. So a lot of this is just kind of feeling out to find what looks right both like just generally and also just my my emotional feeling of what she looks like when she smiles. I was surprised that a lot of people um, were totally put off, baffled, outraged, found it absolutely ridiculous the way Leia came back from getting sucked out into space. And I did not have that impression at all. It just it seemed pretty like a pretty net like we've always known she's a, she has force aptitude. Uh, I never assumed that only the things ever seen in film are the only thing that Jedi's could ever do. I mean, maybe that's the big thing. Like, it feels like a lot of these complaints about the way the Force is used in this is just that it was never established that they can do this in other films. And then if they could have done it in other films, uh, wouldn't they have sort of thing. Um, which gets back, I mentioned Branderson's Laws of Magic, and actually let me just read one real quick because it's super good. Sanderson's Laws. Damon says, go get a good smile? Yeah, easier said than done. Uh, her pig smiles have a lot more teeth. Yeah, I think the fact that these teeth are small now might be a problem. Um, Damon says, I thought Leia using the force to winch herself back in was cool, had no problem with it, and more problem that she survived the blast. Oh, okay. Well, I would think that a black, like, an explosion on the outside of a spaceship that breaks the fuselage would instantly be pulling stuff out. So you're not getting a blast wave like pushing you forward. You might get a little bit, but it would be almost instantly uh, repelled by the by the vacuum. Okay, so Sanderson's first law is an author's ability to solve conflict with magic is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic. A little more detail. If characters, especially viewpoint characters, solve a problem by use of magic, the reader should be made to understand how that magic works. Otherwise, the magic can constitute a deus ex machina. Ideally, the magic is explained to the reader before it is used to resolve a conflict. Much like a sword or a large sum of money, magic is a useful tool. Understanding the tools available to a character helps render helps the reader understand the character's actions. It avoids questions like, where did he get that? Or, how did he do that? Um, yeah. And his third law also applies pretty well to, uh, you know, 
had his third law been enacted in the script, it would have been better. And that is expand on what you already have before you add something new. So uh, in this movie, there was a lot of new added. And to me, that was the theme of the movie was the force is so much more than we've, we've thought it to be. And all the rules that we thought were set in stone, no. The universe is bigger than that. <laughs> and I like that theme. I like that theme so much that it doesn't bother me that uh, Sanderson's rules were not obeyed. However, I do contend that if they would have thought more carefully about those rules, they could have implemented those themes better. Yeah. It looks like the teeth are just bigger. They are just bigger than they are here. <sighs> so I wonder if I just... I mean, maybe I just diagnosed it wrong. Maybe I thought this wasn't working because it was too wide. And there was another reason I didn't like it was set too far back or some other thing. Oh, this is so obnoxious. Why did I ever think I could do a portrait of my wife? So, just as the theme of The Last Jedi, one of the major themes is that failure is necessary for learning. I am embodying that theme tonight. Gonna keep failing so that I can learn. Don't worry, dear, this won't hurt a bit. That's right, Heather can't make things easy for me. Aiden says, I'm surprised they didn't give Leia an easy out by having her uh, be the one that kamikaze the rebel ship. Easy exchange of leadership to Lord Dern. Uh, yes, agreed. I was very surprised that she came back since everybody knows IRL, Carrie Fisher died. Why in the world are they not? I mean, I just, I assumed when she died, I was like, oh, they'll, they'll certainly be adjusting the plot. If she wasn't going to die in this movie already, she certainly will be now. Because it would be foolish to have to rely on CG Princess Leia for, I mean, it's, but, like, if you're going to have her be a character that's still alive, you're going to want to utilize her for dramatic effect. I mean, she is the mother of the main bad guy. Are, are you going to have a voice actress, uh, you know, copying her through a CG? Like, is that really? Is, you guys think you can do that? Good luck with that. Maybe it'll work. I, I haven't looked it up enough. I heard someone say that um, there were CG shots of her in this movie, I did not notice that they were CG. So, if that's the case, then uh, maybe they have done it, and maybe they can do a, a perfect CG replica, and it won't hurt the uh, the film. But I am still skeptical.
Lalitha says, I like that whole doe has purple hair. You would. Do you think it's because they were copying you, Alifa? Sculpting as much. Damon says there is one, at least one I noticed towards the end. Headshot of her just looking off. Fat Cat says, I think I'm gonna cancel the dental appointment. <laughs> well, you know, um, my dad is a dentist and I used to run a dental laboratory out of my bedroom when I was in high school making retainers and space maintainers. So if you can't trust me to be your dentist, who can you trust? Everyone needs purple hair. Yeah, I guess I guess even my mom has uh, some purple hair now, so can't really argue with that. Oh, there's one thing. When I did the new teeth, I noticed that her bilateral incisor here um, is way more indented than I had sculpted it originally. So. Time to shave down the bilateral incisor. My lateral incisor is not words that come out of Luddite mouth, so I trust you with my teeth. Yeah, that's how they get you. You just gotta make up words, and then you'll, you'll trust them with anything. Uh, the only reason I know that these are bilateral incisors is because um, I never developed bilateral incisors. So I have these teeth moved up to this position and they're kind of, they're a little more cone shaped than other teeth. So I kind of have a little bit of a vampire look, which, which is pretty cool. I like it.
mistake a lot of people make when sculpting smiles and teeth that I've seen is they don't look very closely at reference or teeth and they just kind of make them all flat all the way across but teeth each uh, position of the teeth has a fairly unique silhouette and shape so you will end up making very cartoony teeth if you don't use reference or just kind of know because you spent years making uh, space maintainers and retainers and so you bent wires around teeth over and over and over again and got to kind of kind of know them that way Demon says, mine were yanked when I got braces. Large teeth, small jaw. Very hard for me to tear. Yep. Yeah, so we had opposite problems. You had not enough space and I had too much. Yeah, zombie Heather again. Just, I can't get away from zombie Heather, no matter how hard I try. Keeps coming back again and again. so annoying because I was carving these exact teeth just the other day just a tiny bit smaller
Yeah, casting her actual teeth would not be good because this is a half scale bust. So, if I was doing a full scale bust, that could be an option. You know, at some point I just give up and uh, say it's it's a zombie version of her gun. I mean, she's gonna hate it no matter what. If I make it look exactly like her, she's gonna hate it. Actually, actually, I guarantee you, she would like it more if it was a zombie version. <laughs> she does like Walking Dead. faster, redoing the rest of the bust in full scale or redoing her teeth again. <laughs> Good point. I honestly don't know. fastest would be to do it in uh, ZBrush and just 3D print it. That's what would be fastest. But this is as much an act of love as it is a desire to have a final product. So I don't mind that it's vexing and frustrating. That will just make the final product that much more um, special to me. Or just scan her face in the Z brush and she would still dislike it. Yeah, exactly. She hates her face, so she doesn't want a representation of her face hanging around. When I started, originally I was doing it uh, as kind of, I was going to stylize it, like make it art deco with like angles and stuff, but um, 
I could not find a way to make it look pretty and feminine. It kept looking like a weird gargoyle or a Batman mask. Because, I mean, that is, like, already today, you could, for a relatively small amount of money, you could get your face 3D scanned and get a, a print, right? So it's like, why would I go through all this trouble and effort to make a perfect representation of her uh, when I could just, you know, when we could much faster just scan and print? Pretty soon it's going to be pretty common for people to have 3D printed busts that are an exact replica of their head um, in their home because it'll just be, you know, an app you download or whatever for your 3D printer that you got for Christmas. Alita says, why? She's so pretty! Yeah, I think she's pretty too, but like many women, she um, has been conditioned by the world around her to believe that if she doesn't look exactly like, you know, a Photoshop cover model, that she she's not pretty. She had some specific uh, experiences in her childhood where adults said pretty damaging things about about her looks and uh, kind of sent her um, spiraling, I guess you could say. Sadly. Um, I think one of her friend's moms actually said I can't remember if she said, you're ugly, but a follow-up to something she said was, but at least you're skinny. It's like, wow. At least you're skinny. I mean, it might have something to do with her tendency. Like, she has to fight with uh, anorexic, with, you know, feelings, anorexic tendencies. Um... That probably had a big part to do with it. Of course, she doesn't really have to fight with that now because she legitimately can hardly eat anything without getting sick or otherwise wounded because of any number of her medical conditions. Okay, so now her chin just looks ridiculously huge. But that's fairly easy to fix. Slice, slice. Damon says, I don't want reality, I want artistic rendition. I agree. We already have reality. It's right here in front of us. Letha says, that's unfortunate about the adults saying those things. Yep, Damon says, sounds like my wife. Yes, it is very common. Oh, look at that. So I took away, <laughs> I took away the chin going down, and now she just got this blob, so... Apparently it's supposed to go out, not down. Where did that chunk I chopped off go? Ah, here it is. Let's just stick it here. Letha says, I've starved myself in the past, but eventually I decided I like food too much. So now I'm, quote, fat. <laughs> yeah, Letha, you are definitely not fat. But certainly by the standards of photoshopped uh, anorexic models on the covers of magazines, yes, you are fat. But then 
so is everyone who's not anorexic and photoshopped. Hmm, I think, I think the teeth actually need to go out further. Like, like, they need to go out. Yeah, they definitely do, because I'm almost certain the nose is the right distance from the cheeks and the eyes, but the fact that the mouth is way back here, yeah, it needs, every, the whole apparatus needs to come forward. Fry says, I like thicker girls, but not fat. I don't get why girls don't get that most guys do. Dottie says, it's ha sad how some people don't realize how their words can affect people. And then Damon quotes me saying, yes, you are fat. Josh Foreman, 2017. <laughs> Indeed, Dottie. Uh, if I didn't know Aletha as well as I do, I probably uh, would not have said that. He says it's almost 1.30 a.m., so I'm going to bed. Work comes early. Good night, everyone. Good night, Dottie. Thanks for stopping by. Pretty close to wrapping it up myself.
All right. Definitely got the profile working better now by pushing those teeth out. That's good. Need a little more, a little more chin. See you around these parts in a while. Don't worry if you haven't seen Star Wars yet. I don't think we're talking about it anymore, spoiling it. In case that's a concern of yours. that clay around is actually making me warm enough to take off my jacket. It's amazing. It's like it's summer in here. Not really. Part so hard because you have a plane on the upper lip that coming down to the corner and then you've got this rounded tube coming up and then this other like 
is this little line that some people are more pronounced than others. Heather's is not terribly pronounced. Um, that kind of defines the bottom of the lip. It's just, it's just a weird confluence of angles that comes together there. Very hard to capture. Amy enjoying the winter break, been busy. Only seen the first and fourth movies. Huh. First and fourth. Okay. So not a huge Star Wars nerd I see. Uh, yeah, I had to give Damon the power. Um, oh, yep, he explained it. We just, we just had a... Bot swarm just out of nowhere. Never had that before, so he helped eradicate them. It's a good thing too. I came really close to uh, going to an online casino, but uh, he saved me from that fate. Bottom lip thicker is certainly helping. Helping something, I mean. Certainly ain't good yet, but. We can start imagining a light at the end of the tunnel. That's always important on an art project. I think I'm probably getting to the point where I need to just take some time away from it. Look at it another day. It's just frustrating because I hate to leave the end of a video with something looking this horrific. But 
<laughs> but hey, live to fight another day, right? Might help to get some of this chin definition figured out real quick. Trying to climb out of the uncanny valley. Yeah, that's one way to look at it. I think that's why I originally started this piece with the intention of making it stylized. And I'm st I still am going to be doing it stylized, but more with um, surface treatment than with the actual forms. than I was worried it would be at the end so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna call it right here right now and uh, yeah um, you guys make sure you show up on uh, Saturday this Saturday I have a planned um, video I'm gonna be designing a brand new creature uh, with my mom she's gonna be up here for Christmas so we're gonna hang out we're gonna talk Creatures, talk biology, talk science, talk creature design, aesthetics. It's going to be super fun. And all you guys always have great insight and ideas to pitch in while we're doing that kind of stuff. So, so show up, all right? Probably going to shoot for like 1 o'clock Pacific time on Saturday. So yeah, be there or be square. No Star Wars spoilers that time, I promise. All right. See you guys later.